So I'm coming from the frame point of a Facebook marketer, right? And I know that we have to think of things in an omni-channel fashion because performance marketing is talking about the whole funnel, omni-channel, all of that stuff. And to be fair, Google Ads isn't necessarily what I'm good at. I know the va- I know how, why it's valuable. I know how to value it. But from your perspective, I'm really curious, like, how do you go about caring about the real world needs of clients when focusing on Google Ads? Because it seems like it's so easy to juice the numbers. And I don't know, like... I see so many folks saying those numbers just can't be real. The numbers are too high. Let me spend more. And then I spend a bunch more and I make no more money. Yeah. So I think we have to start from the principle that whenever you think you're influenced by some kind of ad out there, it puts a thought or it puts an idea in somebody's brain. And that idea sometimes ends up in the Google search field or somewhere along the side of, hey, I want to look for reviews of this product, or I want to look for YouTube reviews of that product. And as soon as you start using those products, it's very likely that Google is entering that touch point area, that whole journey, as we like to call it. Obviously, it will piggyback on the success of a top of funnel strategy that roll out through Facebook or TikTok or whatever. Obviously that will piggyback on it, but you have to understand that as soon as you ignore that or neglect that impact on somebody's searching behavior or browsing behavior, that there will be others who will jump on that train and they'll benefit from the demand that you're generated. So that will be like the idea, the concept, the vision that I would present somebody who's skeptical of using Google Ads. That's the vision. And then you have the practical implementation of, hey, how, what, what, how does this affect my numbers? It's very mm. common that we, have, that we see overlap. It's very common that we see overlap in touch points, which will then require you to run your numbers on the larger scale of things. Don't just look at your channel's data and see it as a simplistic one-dimensional traffic acquisition channel, but rather zoom out, perform different tests, hold out tests. If you really want to, I'm not a big fan of all or nothing. You can, on product level, if you have multiple products, you can hold out one product for a while and see if that impacts your overall product sales for that particular SKU. All that kind of stuff will help you to holistically approach it and then value Google ads on a much, I think on a more yeah, realistic skill. And then maybe you're not that panicked about those inflated numbers anymore. Yeah, no, I love that. Because one of the things that we talk about in Disruptor School, the Facebook Ads MBA program, and I feel like more and more people are getting around the world is that platform level attribution has value, but also you can't look at the ROAS number, for instance, or like the CP on any <laughs> It's channel. not your like, favorite KPI, is it? <laughs> <laughs> look at that, right? Yeah. So I think the great thing that you said here is, Looking at how it impacts everything and really thinking of it as part of the funnel, because I'll tell you the complete inverse. Like I remember taking a brand to paid social maybe seven, eight years ago, and it was run, it was like a hair supplement brand. And they were all Google ad experts. And I was running Facebook ads. They were like, we're getting a 12X on Google and we're getting a two on Facebook. And like Facebook is dumb and they got rid of it. And It's funny, they're still trying to hire for somebody to fit that role. And I think what they missed entirely is the idea of how they're complementary. You can't compare apples to apples, right? It's not the same thing. One allows, I like to think of it, and let me see what you think of this, is I like to think of it as Google is an intent conversion platform. Facebook is an intent creation platform. And if you think of them in that symbiotic fashion, a great use of Facebook ads or organic or YouTube or TikTok or whatever is to massively amplify the opportunity that Google has to bring in very high profit margin transactions. The thing is also, I think that's on point. I totally agree. I think what you have to be aware of is that there's obviously more multiple stages that people go through in the end like in the end like if people don't know the product if they're not aware of the product if they're not, are not aware of the service we can talk about all kinds of verticals but in general somebody's not aware and you reach them through a top of funnel strategy then you cannot expect the same conversion rates and thus not the same 
profitability on that level as you could expect if somebody's really will like really ready to buy or really ready to engage with whatever he's looking for and again the google search is when people are searching literally for what they need and you have stages within that search you can say hey i'm looking for new sneakers or you can really look for those nike air max i don't know air jordan with right red stripes on them and with the latest blue laces in there. it that is very specific which is more likely that if you show that ad, they will convert much more quickly. However, those are different stages. And I would definitely, yeah, not underestimate the impact of those. Yeah, I love how you're putting that. And maybe we can pivot slightly here and from awareness to purchase, right? That's the funnel. Like, yeah. where do you find the role of Google Ads in your sales funnel? Like, when you're thinking about it, where do you find its role to be best fit? I would really say that we're talking about middle of funnel to bottom of funnel strategies. So I would say, especially on search, right? Search and shopping, those are two similar, similar channels. They are all both on the Google search platform and they show up in the same search result page, right? So we should take a look at those elements separately in the end, but I would just for the simplicity, I would count them as one. And it is because when somebody's basically intent, we see a much higher conversion rate if they're all a little bit more specific because Google is also searched or used as a, as a research platform for everything, everything you want to know, right? How does this work? What is this? What is this kind of idea? So if, if you're having a product within a vertical that is also likely, let's, I don't know, what could we say? Fashion in general. Like if you would say Armani, you could look for more information about a watch or some dress or like basically the designer, you know, behind it and have no intent to buy. So if you show up with your shopping products and your search products or search ads, it's not necessarily going to lead to a sale. But if you're looking for a specific thing in terms of, oh, I need, I want to have those new Armani watches. I want to have the Armani watch with this particular element in that, a black one. Then Google shows you those five, six out there. And if you're part of those three ads or four ads that are visible, chances are there that you're going to sell that watch to that person. So it's, yeah, there's levels, but I would say middle of funnel, bottom of funnel is where we see much the most effect and impact on the overall strategy. Yeah, I love the way you put that. And it's funny, so full transparency, we've done a masterclass with you inside the Facebook Ads MBA program. And we can talk about that in a little bit where you take in, it, it, I love it, I've told people, I literally did this myself in 20 minutes. I took my best five Facebook ads and I built a Google search campaign built around that. And like with the Notion doc and chat GPT and the Google yeah. ads editor went from no ad live to <laughs> completely built out search. And it's getting more and more effective for what it's worth. Like. Yeah. A little bit of feedback. It's been live for three weeks and my CPC has dropped by 60 some odd percent. I've actually been able to cut the budget as my volume of sales increases. Yeah. And what I've noticed, which I didn't appreciate at the time, was that because it was using the great Facebook stuff, what it was doing was it was working simpatico and that it was so effectively capitalizing on the intent using the same language and thought process and and it just works so well at yeah. become at creating that mid and bottom funnel without having to reinvent the wheel. And yeah. it's, it works. It's almost, it's, stupid, it's almost like, stupid. It's almost stupid that yeah. it worked. Like I, I didn't want this to work, but it did. So, yeah, yeah. It's funny. <laughs> I literally, I was going to geek out the Nick Shackleford stuff and I ordered a lift and it was like, okay, it's gonna be 20 some odd minutes, 15 minutes, whatever. And I was literally like, all right, I'm going to go do this thing. And like, before the car got to my house, I went from completely built out successful Facebook campaign to completely built out successful Google campaign that has dropped, that has improved, has allowed me to scale my efficiency about 20, 30% on the acquisition of traffic for that offer and just night and day difference. And I turned off all the other campaigns that I had built as a Google marketer, trying to run Google ads. Cause I was just like, this yeah. is dumb. So for what it's worth, love, love that. We'll drop yeah. a link down below to that masterclass. Cause it's super crazy effective and basically Facebook ads for Google search. Yep. I expanding on that, a question I have for you is maximizing your Google ads. What are some of the biggest mistakes or most common pitfalls people make all the time? Yeah. So I, I would say there's, the, I want to like, just tune back to what you're saying sure. about like how stupid easy it is to roll out a campaign. 
and this I just want to emphasize on the fact that there's so many people out there that are showing Google Ads is this, and we're giving away so much value, and it's going to overwhelm. And obviously, the technique behind that is very likely. I'm just going to overwhelm all the people right there. You can do it too. You can do it too. And then there's so much information overload. There you go. I need your help. It's basically a, a lead gen funnel, right? All the respect for those people out there. They're very solid guys in the web. But I figured if we just going to pull that thing out, like it's going to be simplicity. It's going to be like, I think I personally really believe that most of the Facebook media buyers with their creative knowledge have the, have, have the capacity of running a, let's say a highly profitable Google campaign with like only with 60 to 80% of its power or its, its capabilities. So basically you need very little to leverage as much as you can. And eventually you could use some extra advanced techniques and you could layer and there's, oh, you need to like craft new keyword combinations and you have to copy, keep on optimizing. I know, but I think we're moving into an age. And I think with Facebook, we're talking about the same kind of concept where AI is really taking over yeah. the, the targeting part of things. And back in the days, I've been doing this since 2008, you were like completely in the dark with manually targeting people with keyword combinations that were like five word long, like five yeah. word phrases, right? Oh, yeah. It was all, and you were covering, I don't know, we had campaigns that had each ad group had over, I don't know, five, six keywords, but we had a thousand ad groups in one oh, campaign. Yeah. Oh. And then you had all these single keyword ad groups is like un unimaginable in terms of it's nothing but simple. Yeah, yeah, so, no, so, I, I remember yeah. when I first got my job, when I got my first job in an ad agency, when I got my first big job as director at Omnicom, they gave yeah. me the choice of either managing the Google team or the Facebook team. I looked at the Google team and it was 40,000 like row deep Excel spreadsheets of keywords or Facebook, there was no boss in a million dollar day budget. And so now- And visuals, yeah. and visuals. Like, oh, yeah. that's so sexy. Oh yeah, yeah 100% <laughs> right away. Cause I was just like, there's no way I'm gonna ever. And now I can do it literally in the time it takes for a car to get to my house. So I wanna reduce that overwhelm. And I figured with with obviously using AI tools such as ChatGPT, I think it's really straightforward. And I'm definitely not the first one who came up with this. This is obviously, it's a very logical way to approach these things. But again, the principles behind that, hey, make sure that you cover your bottom of funnel because you don't want to see, see your competitors steal your prospect. I think that principle is leading in this whole course. You make sure that you cover those ends and then work your way up. Like basically generate some conversions. And then once you feed that campaign or feed that account conversions and more conversions, it's going to be easier to make another campaign work because Google's learning from that data. So yeah. Yeah, that's organically organically paid, basically growing gradually. And I then I really tap into that other question you asked me, like, hey, what are some common pitfalls? Is that the gradual aspect, the consistently adding more, like, but slowly but steady. Yeah, uh, it that is definitely I think the biggest contrast with what people have been used to when they're running Facebook ads. I've seen a lot of agencies, also just agencies that do are doing Google on the side. It's just treating them like another Facebook ad campaign. Yeah. So when they hit this threshold, oh, stop this one. Or when they hit that threshold, refresh with a new set of ad copy. Or I don't know, like all the, like very just quickly changing things and touching the campaign so many times, it's, it cannot sit still and develop itself. You have to treat it like a plant, I think. You could see it as a plant. Yeah, no, I love it, that because it's going to grow. Yeah. It's going to get smarter. There is machine. Yeah. There's yeah. a machine learning aspect to it. There is artificial exactly. intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what another pitfall would be is underestimating the, again, the simplicity behind things. So you could say, think about the act, like the end of, end of the funnel and what kind of messaging people want to see when they're at the end of the funnel. Is it very clear that when you know that, for example, you know that your competitor is showing up as well. Don't just write the same ad. <laughs> Yeah. Don't just do the same thing because then you won't stand out. I think one of the nicest features is that you have the ad preview feature. And mm. the ad preview feature is where you can basically type in the search keyword that you like that you want to show up to. And it, depending on the budget that you've set, it will show your ad. But at least they show the ads that are going to be shown. And then you can look at, hey, how much does my ad stand out compared to that? And I think a lot of people are like, especially back uh, like the last 10 years, um, us Google ads marketers 
are not that creative copywriters. Okay. So yeah, that's the, and that opens up that opportunity for the Facebook marketers who have been like playing with language, playing with hooks and CTAs in, in all kinds of ways. Yeah. Leveraging that I think is a huge benefit, but the impatience that Facebook media buyers have is the threat behind that I would be careful with. No, I love that. Cause I say almost the exact same thing to Google folks that are coming into Facebook. It's just, you learn how to speak a language and you want to talk in that way, but there are languages in the world. Like for instance, like you cannot translate English into German and say it in the same way because the vowels and the nouns all go in different spots. Like it's yeah. very clear that you have no, you're not a native speaker. And when I see Google folks come into Facebook, they're not treating it with the same, like they're trying to be heavy DR marketers. And they're yeah. trying to say yeah. the copy is what's getting stuff going. Buy now. Yeah. This is the price. Please give uh, yeah. away the price and all the e e details before people click. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's a coach out there with his own program. It's very high ticket who teaches you how to be great at everything, even though his biggest claim to fame is being successful in a bull market. One of his things he teaches is DR copywriting. And it's just like the core of the way he teaches how to do Facebook and other copywriting is be as aggressive and disrespectful as possible and then target your way down to people that want to do it. It's like, that's sort of, and Facebook is something different. And I love the idea of be treat each discipline with the respect that it deserves yeah. because they all have different capabilities and they're all built to do different things. And in my experience, I don't know how you feel about this, but Google and to another extent, maybe Amazon mm -hmm. buyers tend to be really logical, great with, and the Facebook buyers that are really successful tend to be really great creative problem solvers and I think it's a mindset. And when you find somebody trying to play another game, it just doesn't quite work. It's like, you can see that there's something lost in translation there. Yeah, I, I totally think, I think, uh, yeah, I think you're onto that point where exactly that. If you learn to, if you're such used to play, I don't know, you guys call it soccer. We all used to we call it football. Fair enough. Yeah. 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 So if you, if you would like, like me to teach you soccer, but you think it's, for example, American football or it's rugby. There's there's different rules. There's different styles. Maybe it, maybe it involves some object that you have to pass to the other guy. So there's similarities. It's on a pitch. It is on a line pitch. It's in a stadium. There's a lot of crowd. It's super popular. But there's still a lot of like different aspects to the game. And I think it's not necessarily that you will... Or I think there's another one. There's a, what would it call, what, 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 there's a saying in, in, in Dutch, actually, I don't think it's going to be explained that well. So we can cut that one out. No, but it's about that if you have a great car, it doesn't make you a great driver, right? Yeah. There's this a metaphor of, you know, what a good car looks like, what, a, what how an engine, what an engine looks like. An engineer sees this, like the technology behind all the things, but if they, if you put them in a car itself, it doesn't necessarily mean that he knows how to drive. And I think when you you run your numbers, I'm really good with numbers. I'm an analytical nerd. But if I if you let me lose in a Facebook ad, like if in a Facebook ad campaign, I'd probably destroy everything. As in, oh, I think this is not good. So I, based on these numbers, I would probably kill that. Or right. Basically, because I don't have the right frameworks. I haven't taught. I haven't haven't been taught the frameworks. And the problem with Google is there are just a little bit like there's not so such a. I don't know, copy paste frameworks out there for Google. Yeah. It's really just run your numbers and look at this top down process of, wait, I see outliers in conversion rate or I see outliers in profitability or outliers in AOV, just in one or two metrics. And you just, you just run your analysis because the problem here is not necessarily the ad creative. It's the fact that your the relevancy of the keyword is really high. But in the end, you're looking at the search terms. You are allowed to look at the trends behind each keyword that you've targeted. You know, you're literally selling this, I don't know, this Fitbit Charge 4. You're literally just selling that, okay? This is your product. Yeah. This is the pricing point. And somebody's searching for the Fitbit Charge 4, the black one, just this one that I'm wearing. And you have 200 clicks. Are you going to pause that campaign because it's not relevant? Or are you going to look at your landing page? Because you just can't convert it. Yeah. So yeah. So the difference there is that you can say, okay, we're going to pause this until I figured it out. Or you can use Google as a research platform 
to optimize your landers because or your offer because you're saying hey wait ad preview shows that my pricing point is the same as all these others and it's still getting the same click so there must be something wrong with the offer on other side like it's not the price what else is there and that is the cool thing you can you just run that same campaign i don't know you could even run it for five bucks a day and then optimize it until you've figured out what has been your bottleneck there and then scale it back up again. That's one of those things that you can just use Google for on the side as a research tool before you try to warm people up and say, yeah, this is the newest, latest, perfect product. And you have warmed them up, but then your whole page is just not converting on the bottom of funnel because there are so many alternatives out there that are doing a better job. No, I love that. It's about data integrity and figuring that out. I think that brings me to something we touched about earlier, but I'd love to just get your short view on it is just like understanding is my Google ads audience actually converting? Like how to really understand this is the Google ads issue, or this is Google ads taking credit for things that are happening somewhere else, or this is something where it's a website problem, or how are you taking a look at identifying the pain point when something either looks too good or is soaking up a lot of spend, not really driving the bottom line. Yeah. Yeah. I think that those are multiple scenarios that, that you probably need to do. Like my, my, my favorite and my least favorite answer to all of these questions is it depends. Of course, and it's the course. most, and it's the most boring answer because everybody needs to be very, uh, what's it called? Polarizing in their statements. Of course. Bro ass. Yeah. Anyway, but so what I would, I love to just go through a process of identifying and re- reduction, like the deduce deduction and reduction. So what I would say is I would start relatively broadly and I would run a campaign for always, like almost always a month at least i don't say that i would not touch it anyway like i would just commit to a period of four to four to five weeks like full ca- full calendar weeks so on monday to sunday and go on and then i would just gather data and the data that i'm gathering is obviously on on state level on search term level on ad level there's going to be feedback that i'm getting from google on on that level so you could say hey there's on this search term we see these number of clicks we see on that ad creative, that number of impressions and CTR. This is Google's favorite ad creative combination because you're, you're feeding Google different headlines, different descriptions and work your way from there. If there's no conversion at all, you know, that is a possibility, right? But then it's very likely that the intent doesn't match, doesn't ma- doesn't meet what people expect. Yeah, there's like a lack so- of congruency there. Yeah, yeah. It is very like it, in, in the unlikely event, it doesn't, it doesn't convert at all. I would, first of all, like probably in the first week already, I want to just compare what my ads look like compared to the others. So it could be that you're, like I said in the previous example, like that your pricing point is way out of comparison. Okay. That's one very common issue. Second thing I would like to point out is that I see a lot of people underestimate is that the impact of running both Google as well as Amazon, because Amazon is taking up like, oh, as soon as you're selling on Amazon, it's automatically adding that keyword to their campaigns. And there, they don't give a crap about profits. So they will just appear next to that keyword that you also booked, okay? Just assuming that's happening, then your offer needs to be different than that offer you've shown on Amazon, okay? You cannot get away with just, I don't know, a free shipping, for example. Prime users are used to getting that kind of service. Or they could, for example, just they, they just value Amazon a lot. We see we've seen brands selling on Amazon and on Google, okay? Also on Facebook, very successful, seven, eight, nine figures even. And we just saw that we had to accept that a CPA for a branded campaign was over 50 bucks. Okay. That was a normal because like a very like high compared to let's say an industry standard CPA. What we did to get that down, to make sure that the ad copy stood out. We made sure that the subscription model was emphasized on. We made sure that there were benefits for, for shipping, but also for example, for first time users, first time buyers, get a, get that promotion in there to, to basically, yeah, steal or make sure that people are not also clicking on the Amazon ad and you're losing a click. And people buy on Amazon, which loses, basically you're losing your customer data, right? So you're, you yeah. don't know where that money went. So that is a very interesting thing that I would like to point out. And that coming back to the original question where you would say, hey, if that is not converting, 
and you would still, you're not having comp a competition from Amazon, then you rule out if it's the competition, if it's Amazon. And then third, it's, it could be that also the search terms are too broad. Like it's basically like we had, the, I think in our master, like in our master class, where we're using the example of that t-shirt brand. Yeah. Yeah. And t-shirt brand is if you're just adding t-shirt in that keyword as a broad, Google can just say, oh, you know what? I'm just also going to add in a Zara t-shirt. Could be. So be sure that especially in the first days after you've launched that campaign, that you keep an eye on the search terms that are actually being triggered and add some negatives while you're seeing those trends to maybe go too broad or too generic. And then you're making basically sure that you're streamlining towards the very relevant search term for that product or your brand. And I just don't, I just don't think that after like, if your offer is solid, if you've been proven that offer has been solid through top of funnel, middle of funnel strategies in Facebook, I can't imagine not converting for Google. Yeah, you know? no, I love so that, that. That's that. Yeah, so that, that's I, and I've rarely seen a brand that has not been successful in Google while they were successful in Facebook. But there's def definitely differences in volume. That was definitely the case. Yeah. yeah, which I think brings me maybe to the last question I was going to ask, which is just yeah. creating that perfect Google Ads system. If we're going to start day one. What does that look like? What is step one, step two, step three? Let's assume I've got a, a store where I'm selling some stuff or I've got a business that is BSL driven, right? What is that step one, two, and three look like to really build one out? Because I feel like there's just so many choices. There's so many options. There's so many things to click yeah. on. There's so many things to yeah. look at. In the interface, is it going to be like Google? Okay. So first of all, you have to understand Google is moving towards AI-driven campaigns. And it's really trying to move people into this new campaign type, or actually not necessarily new, but latest campaign type is Performance Max. It's been the trend. And I think everybody eventually ends up using Pmax. However, Pmax is still in the construction phase in terms of transparency. It's not really showing all the details of the campaigns. And it's very, it's error prone. If you just give Google money and they promise like in the four weeks that it's running, it's likely going to convert. But if it doesn't, you don't know why it's not. And if it does, you don't know why it is. There's just a limited insight. I'm not like against using and testing that stuff, but if you're just getting into the interface and there's a lot of choice, I would definitely start with Google search. It's also why we started the masterclass with that yep. is because you're building up that knowledge around the prospect on the Google search platform. And the knowledge I think is valuable for the reasons I've previously mentioned, not only to generate sales that, you know, could even fall in the hands of your competitors, but also to, to research on what people are actually, what language do they use in order to find your product? What kind of search terms are used? What are your competitors on the search field? So you can look at their ads and look at what they're doing on Facebook and compare and learn and evolve in your co complete strategy. Okay. So that's, I think, where you should start. The second step, and that's also going to be in the in, under construction, is obviously Google Shopping. If you're running e-commerce and you're not on Google Shopping, you're going to miss out on a lot of opportunities simply because people see the product, they see the price, after they search for it and they haven't clicked on it yet, you're not paying for anything, so, right? You're only paying for the click. So unless your product is, I don't know, a terrible product and it's you're competing against 25 other companies or stores, it's just very common sense. Like it's common sense that you're also running Google Shopping, okay? Those two things I would definitely take into account. And one of the things that I really want to warn people for is that they have to make sure before they run anything, they have to set up their conversion pixel the right way. And what if one of those, and I maybe we're going a little bit too much too deep in this, but what I've seen a lot of the times is that because you guys, your, your, uh, your community is probably running their at like their store on Shopify. Okay. It's very likely that they have and Shopify and Google are partners. Okay. They are friends. They go hand in hand and it's because Shopify is getting a nice, Google premier partner kickback fee from Google. So they're, and they have their Google native app inside of that. Okay. It's where they earn money. So what happens is that if you use the Google native app and you're very likely just going to use it because it's very user-friendly, you connect the app and you set up your campaign, you set up the billing and you're almost done running everything 
just very quickly. But as soon as you start using that feature, on the one end is conversion tracking. Conversion tracking is set up through the Google Shopping or the Google app. And you're maybe your media buyer thought, I just also want to import Google Analytics conversions. And you set it the wrong way. And it's tracking two sales for each sale that actually happened. Numbers look inflated, I'll promise you. Okay, what, what happens a lot, I'm auditing, let's say every other month, monitoring a couple of accounts and almost, let's say four out of five accounts, they have issues with some issue with conversion tracking. It's either not set, if there's double uh, conversion tracking, there's add to carts being used as the primary conversion, which is a little yeah. dangerous. Or all, 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 like paid shoes, even there were paid shoes being counted as conversions. And then we, on the campaign levels, oh, I got a, I don't know. I had a CPA of one or two. Yeah. Maybe that's, yeah, it's a little bit deflated in that sense. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not as good as it looks. Uh, then, I mean, let me call yeah. myself out here for one quick second. Yeah. One of the things that I've done, somebody taught me this, this guy, Chris, who's behind blueprint. That's like the largest MCAT and LSAT test prep. Okay. But inside of your Google Ads Manager, there's a segment called conversions. And the first option is conversion action. Mm. And like, <laughs> I saw one was like $1.67 or something. I'm like, man, this is great. And I look up at it, it's like free ebook giveaway. Oh, we're not making it. Now, to be fair, I think the guy was also buying leads for about $2.50. So the free ebook giveaway was actually helpful, yeah, but sure, yeah. like it wasn't the thing. If you have a bunch of stuff, it's the easiest way to QA ever. Because the report literally uh -huh. tells you, okay, there's 173 of these things. Okay, 112 of them are this, 40 of them are yeah. this, and then there's six that are actually the one you want to go to. And like literally just figuring that out yeah. fundamentally Ugh. changed the game for me the first time I saw that mistake. And I was just yeah. like, and I, it, he was looking at my shit because I was working with him and oh my God. And I've done that myself where I've realized that I'm not training the machine to actually try to do the thing I'm trying to get it to do. Exactly. No, that's what the problem is. I think what we, we actually ran a test on performance max, all, like basically telling them like, here's add to cart. So here's the problem with add to cart and other event-based conversion actions. Okay. And especially with Pmax, Pmax is delivering on, and for the people that know what Pmax is, Performance Max, it runs through the complete Google Ads inventory. Okay. So we're talking about Google search, shopping, display, YouTube, and discovery, which is Gmail ads and the discovery feed that people have on their Android phone. Okay. So what happens is it's, it's just blasting out there. It's very cheap inventory because there's a lot of that, right? Meaning that it just generates a lot of touch points and it generates a lot of data points of, oh yeah, inside, inside, machine learning is doing its job and eventually it will hit successes and learn from that. However, if you put in there the add to cart or initiate checkout or whatever event-based metric, event-based conversion, here's the problem with the display network. There's a lot of shitty websites out there that are part of that display network and it's being abused by bots. So what happens is they just see, oh, this is a, this is another site that runs. They're just clicking through. They're making bots click on the ad and they feed Google with bot click events. And you're seeing, ah, oh, I see a lot of ad to carts. I just don't see any conversion, any purchase from it. But Google is, oh, this website is probably the best website to deliver the ads to. So it's going to feed and feed that inventory with those kinds of sites. I've seen a lot of, oh yeah, no, well, probably not going to do that again. I think we tested it twice and we saw abysmal results. So not recommended. So don't do that. Like really stay away from, and the problem is with lead gen, it's a similar thing. Like lead gen is obviously a lot of those is based on events. So if you're doing a VSL or that kind of stuff, Pmax is probably not the type of campaign you want to start with anyway, because again, you don't have a benchmark. You don't have the, what is normal kind of thing. And if you don't have that, you easily believe that Google is doing a great job and then you end up just losing a lot of money. Yeah. My man, I really appreciate this. I want to take the last moment we have here and just talk yeah. about the masterclass. We've referenced it a few times and this is yeah. Google search or Facebook advertisers. I'll leave it with this and then you can describe it and maybe take us out with it. But I'd love for you to tell us the what, start with the why, and then get us into what it is, what people can expect and what the outcome might be from it. Because I think earlier I talked about my experience, but I'm just one person. I would love to know you came up with this. What is this thing you saw? Walk me through it. Yeah. So I would say that after 15 years of BC running Google ads, I've been around for a while. 
And I've seen Google Ads transform from a very nerdy technical kind of channel for performance marketers, turn into much more of a dynamic, creative marketing channel that can run top to bottom, like in terms of funnel. Okay. And what I found in the last couple of years, I've been seeing that development, like gradually move towards those AI driven campaigns. Okay. Like smart bidding technology is you just give Google a little bit of data and Google will optimize your bids. So you're running a profitable campaign. Okay. What I've seen as well, especially in the last five years, since I've been more involved in agency world, where I've been speaking to a lot of Facebook agencies out there, I've been connecting with people like you on Geek Out as well, where we say, hey, this is what are some typical, I want to stay away from Google because they still have that name of a boring plain text channel. And so I just want to stay away. Yeah, we tested it once, but it didn't work. And I heard that over and over again. I was like, what? It's so easy. It's so easy if you just understand the principles behind Google. But then I talked about, I talked to those Facebook media buyers and they all just used all these, I don't know, all these phrases like this is the sneak attack framework and yeah, that's the, yeah. the whatever uh, method. Yeah. So <laughs> all these methods out there. And I just understood that there's, oh, wait, so like, this is this, they just follow a pro a proven process and they copy paste it on this, like copy paste it to Facebook and maybe it works fine. And they have another option and have another option and they have another option. But basically, there's like this nice playbook that you can go through. And then you have success with Facebook ads. That's it. But Google, I think that whole framework doesn't necessarily exist other than understanding the difference like in, in mindset between those two channels. And if you apply the principles in that way, I think it's not as overwhelming as you think it is. So I try to you, like place myself into the position of a Facebook media buyer. Hey, what is a typical situation a Facebook media buyer is in? And what are some typical pitfalls I've heard over the last years. What are some typical things that, that people have been doing when I've encountered, when I've done audits with them, when I've been training them. And then, yeah, basically combine that all into the masterclass. Hey, these are typical mindset problems that you might encounter and you need to stay away from. And instead you have to do and do this when you start your, your new campaign. And basically that's the first part. And the second part is that we're just going to walk you through the setup, like these are the essentials that you need to take into account before setting up the campaign. And then the actual campaign walkthrough, the campaign setup walkthrough is the final, final chapter of the series that, that, uh, and yeah, it's been like super powerful. As you said, like you could basically do it. We do it live, right? We do it live yeah, in the session. Like quite literally, just, it's like a 30 we, minute video and you go from done, like from zero yeah. to completely built out. Yeah. I've been improv. In, <laughs> I've been doing it improv on, okay. Give me a brand name that that I need to mimic and I'm just going to set up that campaign based on the existing ad copy in their Facebook ads. I use Facebook assets like yeah. the, the ad library and I'm just going to pull in that data and I'm just going to let ChatGPT come up with a structure and I'm going to show you how to import that in Google Ads Editor. It's like taking you by the hand basically from A to B yeah. and C and then obviously we're going to we're going to talk about next steps on like how to run it from day 1 to the first month. Yeah. And obviously ex expand with Google shopping, which is, I think the next step in the bottom of funnel that you should cover as a, as an agency. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And it's super exciting. And I think what I love more than anything is it allows somebody to leverage what they're good at. And then it's a tool that does the translation for you and all the work. Yeah. yeah. And I can talk from personal experience, having done it when I launched Day one was like five, six dollar clicks or whatever. Today I'm getting clicks for a dollar thirty-five. And the volume of traffic that I'm getting out of it has actually gone up as my budget is coming down. And just it has been, I've been messing with it just to see what does this work. And yeah, I think even when following the rules, I did everything and then I went back at the end and added some Facebook thinking. And it took me two weeks to unpack all the Facebook dumb ideas. And like, I DM'd you, I was like, this doesn't seem to work. He did this thing. Oh, of course. <laughs> and even then, like, it's on my playlist to do. It's on my list of things to do today. Like, while having lunch today, I'm going to build another Google ads, a search campaign from a successful Facebook budget. And like, the idea that I'm literally just going to be sitting here, like having some fish. And, and on, on my free time, just setting machine, okay, do that thing, cool. 
Eat, and yeah. then it's, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready for the next step. Okay, cool. Hit the button. Done. All right. Yeah, and compare like, that to the overwhelm that people feel like when there's, oh, Google. Oh, no, that's, I'm going to step away. Never mind. Uh, let me play with Facebook. That's fine. But Google, don't touch it. But that's yeah. exactly what I try to achieve. Oh. It's so much easier to, to than people think. Just be sure, again, like hygiene is everything. Make sure that you base your decision on the right data. And that's the data nerd in me that needs to set the disclaimer right there. Don't just throw like a huge budget to it and think that Google is just going to magically find all the customers. It requires some guidance, especially if it's not been, if there's no account history, if there's nothing in yeah. that campaign that has been proven anything. So yeah, but gradually, yeah, I think that's the experimental mindset right there. I think it's really yeah. Cool. I'll tell you the one optimization that I've been doing to it. And then maybe let you go and talk about, you can tell people how, where to find you and all yeah. that stuff. And by the way, the yeah. mask we're talking about, I'll drop a link down below so you can check it out. You can also just find it on, on disruptorschool.com. It's Google, or sorry, it's Google search for Facebook ads. It's literally disruptorschool.com backslash Google search for Facebook ads. Check that out. I should probably set up a Google, I'm going to set up a Google search campaign for it. Like immediately after this, when people look for it, it's right yeah, there. Very smart, very smart, uh, very I'm literally smart. using everything we're talking about and I'm going to do that yeah. over lunch, which is just dumb. Yeah. I'm so excited. But here's what I did is it made a campaign with three different ad groups in it. And one ad group was getting all the money and the, the cost was a little high. So what I started doing was just notching down the bid. Like, I think it was at like a hundred, like I knocked down the bid about 5% until the yeah. other ad group started to get budget. And yeah. then the cost kept coming down and coming down. And I've been basically just bringing down my bid on a regular basis. And the cost has just been continually getting better. And the quality of the traffic has improved too. And yeah. I think I'm just literally telling, like my impression is I'm telling Google, this is what I want to do, but I'm not willing to overpay. And yeah. as a result, it's just getting me more and more people. And as it gets more and more people, the quality of people that it gets me gets better and better. I don't know. That's but, what I'm interpreting out of it. I don't, as the Facebook yeah. guy, that's how I'm looking mm, at it. Yeah. So I'm going to counter that thought a little bit. I think you're in, on the right path, first of all. Okay, I cool, think that's, cool. But let me address this. Do you think, what do you think converts better? The number one position on Google search or the number five? I'm not talking about volume. I'm talking yeah, about I'm going to say probably rates. the number one position. Why do you think that? Because it's the first thing. It's above the fold, so it's the easiest. Yeah. I think yeah. I'd rather get one number one than three number fives. Okay. Because here's the challenge. Do you think that people like immediately buy if they see four alternatives next to it? Probably do you think, not. Yeah. So here's the thing. Like Obviously, you're right in terms of amount of conversions. Okay. Like you're probably getting the most clicks and therefore in volume, you're going to get the most conversions. You gotta also pay the highest price. Like back in the days, you could basically optimize for position. Like that metric, mm, they've been removing okay. that metric because it's not, yeah, it's so dynamic, right? There's one, one, one. Sometimes you see a video on the number one position. Sometimes you see shopping. Sometimes you see organic. Sometimes you see paid. So they've get rid, gotten rid of that whole metric. However, the principle still stands. If you see the first thing that you see, you click on almost blindly. But sometimes the targeting is just off. Or people are like, and you're like, you're just grabbing all the number one clicks, but people are not ready to buy yet. And they see the number two and the number three and the number four, and they decide to go with number three after they've been researching their things. And what mm. happens is that in that sense, it makes sense that you're paying the highest price, the highest cost per conversion. If you're like just giving everything like to Google, please show my ad top of page. I don't care. From a brand strategy, it might make sense because you want to dominate the real estate in there. But if you are, if you have margins that you need to take into account, you might want to start a little bit lower and gradually move your way up as you prove that conversion is like that conversion is coming in. Yeah, so, so this you, is my problem. Is yeah. I think I started yeah. the, the Facebook thing that I did is I started it with like auto bu budget or like a high yeah. bid, and I've been pranking my way down. Yeah, and like yeah. and I asked you what was going on after I did that, and I was like, <laughs> screw it, I'm just gonna. Yeah. What I'm gonna do today? I'm gonna do it at like the dollar or whatever and work my way up. I think I started at like a yeah. hundred bucks, and I'm knocking it yeah. all the way down. So and you could really apply like twenty percent thresholds, like every other day. If you just reflect on the data that comes in, if you see that volume is going up, that CTRs are remain, remain stable or even increasing, you could safely just add a little bit more to that manual bid. I'm talking about manual bids, guys. If you're going through the setup of a search campaign, just so you know. I'm taking Google notes on this for what I'm going to yeah. do today, like literally right exactly. now. Exactly. Google is pushing for every automation possible, okay? It's going to 
promote smart bidding. It's going to promote that you should maybe just set up maximized conversions or you should set up uh, like target ROAS or target CPA campaigns. It's going to move you into that direction. But if you're, if you don't have any conversion data, it's, and then you're trying to, for example, run your branded ads, your own brand, manual CPC is fine to start with. You can just gradually increase your bids and see once you're like, there's not, no rush. You can just gradually go and up, go up in your bids and stop when you see traction and you can analyze metrics such as impression share, which is showing how many times your ad has shown compared to the number of times it could have been shown. For example, if your impression share is 90%, You've been showing up 90% of the time, meaning that there's still a little bit more like scaling room, like in terms of reach, in terms of ad impressions, but it's not, you're not going to hit like hundred percent without really paying the highest price. And for a branded campaign, to be honest, you should maybe leave a little bit of room for the competitors because they're paying the highest price, right? Mm -hmm. You forget about the facts. And that's also what we're talking about in the mask class is that quality is so important. Like quality yeah. score is a factor that, that Google takes into account. Hey, is the ad resonating with the search term? And is the landing page resonating with the ad? And is the landing page fast? Like those factors are very important. So for example, if, you're, if your competitor decides to run a branded campaign on your brand, okay, a competitor campaign, I wouldn't say that they shouldn't do it. If they're doing it, it's going to be likely costing them a lot more than it's costing you simply because you decided to increase the budget a little bit and then they have to pay like at least five times is the amount of money okay yeah. because they are showing up for that same click just not as often and much more expensive i'm like okay fine we haven't run like a hundred percent impression share branded campaign for a while because it's been it's been forcing us to really pay the highest price per click that's just simply the reason but for any other campaign just so you know you can you just also gradually increase and gradually increase your CPC bits and learn from that data first before you move into any AI driven campaign bit bit strategy. That's I think that's my main advice for anyone who's starting. It's a different story if you're already running a lot of campaigns, you've been seeing a lot of success, and you're just trying to I don't know simplify your approach. Then there's different scenarios, but we can definitely talk about in in a hot seat session, Charlie, if you're if you're up for that. Yeah, 100%. We can bring you back into Disruptor School just for one of those things. And for the folks in Disruptor yeah. School, they can get that too. My man, this has been super awesome. I really appreciate it. And let me leave you with the last word. I'll just say this. Thank you. Really, thank you a lot. This has been super informative and exciting. And I'm really appreciative. And I just want you to make sure that if anybody wants to find you, they know where to get yeah. you. Anything that you want to say, anything you want to plug, let me leave you the last word. And yeah. we can go from there, man. Thank you <laughs> Absolutely. so much. It's been a pleasure that I was on. Yeah, people can find me on ecom-ads.com, which is the agency that I've been running for a couple of years now. But if you search for Raul van Heeren on Twitter or on Facebook or LinkedIn, we can connect and definitely we can, can talk about more advanced strategies if there's any any need to yeah, connect and show some love. If you found the masterclass helpful, obviously, that's going to be highly appreciated. I love it, man. Thank you so much, dude. I will talk to you later. Thanks, dude. Yeah. Take care, man. Bye. Bye.